We now know that when given better tools, people can evolve and adapt and take advantage of them. We're going to be talking about enterprise software, how it's changing, why it's changing, and what it means for the tools that we all use. That's me as a developer. Um, but I actually have a degree in anthropology as a founder and as a CEO. Uh, I've spent time trying to be like a little bit of an armchair anthropologist, trying to think what makes an organization really successful. And I've had the privilege to spend a lot of time with developers. I've managed teams of developers. And I think I've come away with a real understanding and an admiration for how developers work and the tools that they use, because they work differently than all of us. We're like normal users, and developers are power users. They use computers differently. And what gets me excited is that I think we're all starting to think and work like developers. And so you might see headlines out there that say, like, oh, in the future, everyone needs to learn how to code. That's not what this is about. This is really about a mindset. And so the developer's way, for me, is all about efficiency, and it's about creative expression. It's about focusing those limited mental calories that you have in a given day and spending them on the highest and best uses of your time and not on the things like constantly figuring out with your mouse how to like change applications, how to work slowly on a computer. It's about being really powerful with a computer. Right? You want to be a power user. And the developer's way to me is exciting because as we adopt and embrace these ways of working, it unleashes our ability to focus on the best uses of our times and making computers doing what we want them to do and not just for trying to figure out how to make them work. So I'm just going to run through uh, what I think are the hallmarks of the developer's way, and then we're going to go through some examples. Then we're going to talk about new technology that's emerging in the enterprise that takes advantage of these developer paradigms. Collaboration at scale, low latency communication, developers leverage unlimited storage and compute, and last but not least, don't repeat yourself, a key mantra. So now let's go into examples about what I mean. Collaboration at scale. Developers know how to collaborate synchronously at the same time, as well as asynchronously, meaning like I do some work, and then maybe you do some work, then someone else does some work a little bit later on, and they have tools to bring it all together. But that's not how us normals work. We work differently. You can imagine that like we're working on a team project, maybe we're working on our annual planning program, and we're all starting to send around attachments to each other. And you know what happens to these attachments? You've all had this experience. The attachments start to look like version 3, version 4, final, final version 2, final version 3, really, really final, like use this file.pptx. Like we've all had that file. <laughs> Developers don't have that problem. They use something called a revision control system, where every single person has a copy of their files and an endless timeline of all the versions of those files, and they can each make their changes. And the revision control system really elegantly brings it all together, deals with all the conflicts, shows who made what changes, merges it all together. And this is such an important one because entire movements are based on this. The entire open source movement would not work without the revision control system. Developers have had this for years, and they know how to collaborate at scale. But we, we're still passing around attachments. In fact, I did that building this presentation. This might not even be the right version. <laughs> Low latency communication. This is, to me, really simply the art of communicating an idea in your head as quickly as possible into the computer as an instruction. And developers know how to do this. If you've seen any hacker movies, you know that developers use command lines. They know that it's highly expressive and it's super efficient. But like nothing is more frustrating than when I go behind someone who's not a power user, who's not a developer, and watch them use a computer. Imagine that you're, you know, you're working on a team project, you're working with your group on something, you're all in a Slack channel, and you need to make a key point, like something really important, and to make your key point, you need to put a photo of a cat into the Slack channel. Well, we know what that looks like. You go to your browser, you open a new tab, you click around to the tab, you click on Google Images. You're like, I want a cat photo. No, I don't want that cat photo. It's been like five internet years. So much time has gone by. Like, cat gifts aren't even funny anymore. Your teammates are wondering why you're not working. You have not finally go back to Slack. You paste it in there. It takes forever. But that's not what a developer would do. What a developer would do is they would just type backslash Giphy, a bot would run out to the internet, find the funny photo of a cat, you like it, you just hit enter and you're done, you're back to work, you made your point, it was timely, super efficient. Okay, leveraging unlimited storage and compute. Developers write code and when they deploy that code, 
their code can generate tons of log files. And because storage is so cheap, they store everything forever. And then they get to use applications like New Relic or App Dynamics to do performance monitoring, to surface insights of where that code is fast or slow, or how people are using it. That allows them to focus those mental calories on the areas of their code where it matters most. But we don't have things that are giving us insights into the work that we do, telling us where to focus. So they have all this cool power. Well, like when I'm helping somebody with a sales commission plan, there's no software that's looking back in time at all the previous sales commission plans and all the performance, telling me, hey, if you just turn these knobs, you might improve revenue. They have all these cool tools, but we don't have them. And last but not least, don't repeat yourself. Such an important developer mantra that it has its own Wikipedia page. I will say that I think developers are unfailingly the laziest people I know. And I say that as a compliment. Anytime they have to do work that has to be done over and over again, or they have to use a component that they think they might reuse again in the future, they're going to find a way to automate it. Take, for example, the date picker widget. You might not know that it's called a date picker widget, but you've definitely seen it before. You use it when you're booking a flight. You might use it when you're getting tickets for a concert. And like, you know, it has a little squiggly thing on the left that lets you go back a month, it has a squiggly thing on the right that lets you go forward a month. Like, everyone knows what this looks like. And it turns out, actually, date picker widgets are really hard to code up. Date math and calendar math is really, really hard. So why do they all look the same? Because there's a few very popular open source ones that developers just reuse over and over again. They're tried and tested. They've been bug tested. Everyone just uses them. And yet, I'm writing the same emails over and over again. I'm building the same financial models over and over again. I don't get the benefit of don't repeat yourself the way developers do. And so you might hear these things, and you're like, oh, that's great. Like, those are all things that are for developers. That doesn't apply to me. I work in marketing. I work in HR. I work in finance. But what we've seen here is when you're given the right tools, people adapt. And I always like to think back to like, the introduction of the iPhone. Remember, it had no keyboard. And like, Steve Ballmer was making fun of it. And the guys that were making the, the BlackBerry said nobody would ever use the iPhone for anything serious. Well, I think we're in a room today where I'm sure every single person here has a phone without a keyboard. Even my 75-year-old dad, who's not somebody who rapidly adopts technology, he has an iPhone, and it's the remote control for his life. So we now know that when given better tools, people can evolve and adapt and take advantage of them. And so I'm going to show you now a bunch of software that harnesses these developer paradigms that are available today, and it's just the beginning. I think we're in a major transition in the market where people want software that really appeals to their highest and best use, and not just like the lowest common denominator. So I spend most of my day in email, so that's exactly where we're going to start. So I write the same email 10 or 15 times a week. Hey, I'm in Menlo Park, Mondays and Fridays, San Francisco, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Here's my EA. Here's where our offices are. Tell me where you want to meet. I'll make it easy, whatever. But like with Superhuman, A, I can use a command line, so it's super efficient. And I can use snippets, so it's an automatic response. That efficiency is really, really powerful. But what gets me most excited is it sets me up for the future. In the future, we might be using speech, speech to talk to our computers the same way a lot of us talk to our phones. Or if you saw Elon Musk's Neuralink announcement, we might have brain-to-computer interfaces coming out. And that means you might just think something, and your computer will do it. But all of those kinds of new features coming out, they essentially turn something into a command line. They translate your speech or your thought into a command line. So the sooner that we embrace and adopt command line interfaces, the sooner we'll be ready to upgrade to the future. OK, after email, I spend a ton of time searching for things, whether it's somebody on LinkedIn, a record in Salesforce, maybe it's a file. And the thing about search is, as we move more and more to cloud applications and to SaaS applications, I oftentimes don't know exactly what system the thing I'm looking for is in. If I gave a presentation to somebody, do I have to go look in Salesforce for that customer record and see if the presentation's tied to it, or do I go look in Box or Dropbox or Google Drive? So this is Command E. Command E is a brand new twist on enterprise search. It's blazingly fast, and it's not a web page that you go to. It's just a command line that pops up with a command, Command E, and it searches across all your SaaS applications. It actually also leverages that unlimited storage and compute to index everything you need in the SaaS ecosystem. Like files have just totally disappeared. This is really inspiring to me, because when I think about search today, it's a narrative that's almost entirely controlled by an advertising company. But this is a brand new take on search. It just shows up in a command line, and it makes my work life much easier, and I find that very inspiring. So most of you, you're, this is like a room full of seasoned operators, executives, founders, and CEOs. And you've all been familiar with the pains of the annual planning process. 
How many wrecks are we we gonna open? Like who are we gonna give raises to? How are we gonna restructure? And usually that process happens through spreadsheets that are passed around from finance or HR people. And like, it's one of the most obnoxious processes because you don't have answers to the questions that you really have. Are we giving raises to the right people? Do the raises we're giving tie to the performance reviews we did three months ago? Am I giving people, am I opening wrecks in the right places? Am I giving raises in a fair and equitable way? Are we doing pay parity across the company? These are the thoughtful questions that people are asking, but that spreadsheet doesn't answer them. And ChartHop is exactly the kind of software you would build if you were an engineering manager sick of dealing with that spreadsheet. And what you really want is a revision control system that treats the organization as code, giving you that timeline to go back and forth to see how the organization's evolved, tying into other systems of record, whether it's something like Carter for your stock plan, whether it's into your financial systems to see who's being paid to make sure you have pay parity across the organization. It's supremely powerful. And what's really cool is because it is that system of record and it has that revision control system, it gives you out-of-the-box reports that show you exactly how your organization is behaving. You can create scenarios, you can submit them to your boss, and you can basically have your boss approve them and merge them back into the org chart. Really, by treating the organization as code and leveraging these developer paradigms, you're able to answer these questions that organizations today that are trying to be more thoughtful about their planning and their growth are asking. So this is ChartHop, supremely cool. What about salespeople? Well, if there's one thing, I love salespeople. I'm like an enterprise guy at heart. And if there's one thing I know is salespeople love to sell and they hate doing data entry. They hate going into Salesforce and constantly updating the status of deals. This is where people.ai comes in. In fact, actually, this reminds me of a story at Cisco. When I was at Cisco, one time the quarter ended and a $30 million deal landed at the end of the quarter. It never showed up in Salesforce. It was never in my weekly forecast. And so I called up the sales and I was like, hey, this is amazing. A $30 million deal, thank you. But like, why didn't you put it into Salesforce? Why didn't, why didn't I see it before? And he goes, oh, I've been working on this deal for nine months. That was a huge deal. But if I put it into Salesforce, my manager would have been breathing down my neck, asking for updates constantly, asking me to constantly update when the last time I talked to the customer was. Like, we've all been that manager probably. A $30 million deal is a big deal. And so I was like, okay. And then I realized that was a trend. The best sales reps at Cisco who had the biggest deals never put them into Salesforce. And this is where people.ai comes in. People.ai can scan a sales rep's email system and calendar system and pull in all that latent data, all that metadata, by leveraging the unlimited storage and compute and connecting into those systems and pulling and constantly updating records. But that's not even the coolest part. It's great that it saves sales reps time, but what really happens is when the AI kicks in. By leveraging all that latent data, you get insights. The same way a developer gets insights about where to focus their code for performance, a sales rep now gets a personal sales coach that shows them maybe the sentiment in their emails, the frequency of their communication, how they're setting up meetings, and that personal sales coach can help them go from being a mediocre sales rep to being the best performing sales rep. Okay, my last example. So one of the holy grails for team collaboration is the idea of being able to share information implicitly. Like we share things explicitly when we know they're interesting. Hey, I saw this cool website, I saw this cool link, hey, read this thing. That's when you know a priori that it's explicitly interesting. But what about all these things we see on our screen that we don't know that they're interesting? We don't know that our coworker wants to know about them. What if there was a way to create this collective hive mind on the teams that we're with that could surface insights when they come up? So my background is in security, so I'm gonna give you a security example of what I mean. Imagine that, for a second, that you're like a cybersecurity investigator and you're looking through firewall logs at websites trying to figure out if they're benign or malicious. And two desks over to you, your colleague, her job is totally different. She's scanning the dark web, looking for password files or malware, and she has no idea what you're working on. But what if she finds a website on a dark web forum that, you're af- that you also would be looking at in your firewall logs? What if there was software that could connect the dots and say, hey, maybe this website's actually malicious because it shows up in the dark web? Well, this is what Polarity does. It's software that sort of scre- reads your screen, pays attention to all the work-related stuff, is really smart about ignoring all the personal stuff, and it's sort of like your own Google search engine that works with your team and highlights inferences that match across your team at the right moment. So those are a bunch of examples, and I've shown you how you can leverage data to be more effective at your job. You can be more efficient by leveraging the command line and things like snippets, and this is what turns us normal people into power users. And it's what gets me excited about the future of software development is that, again, like I said at the beginning, it's not catering to that lowest common denominator, it's really catering to that highest common multiple. And there's a few reasons why this is all happening right now. The first is that the workforce composition is changing. 
It's increasingly being made up of digital natives. These are the people that grew up mobile first, and their expectations for the quality of software is way up here. They're not used to that traditional enterprise software that's clunky to use and annoying to use. So that's one change. They want powerful software. They want to be power users. But it's been paired with one other change that's fundamentally shifting what's happening in the enterprise today, and that's that they have budget. This is the first time we've really seen over the last few years that enterprise buying authority has been pushed way down into organizations. Software companies now are marketing-led and can sell bottoms up. It's not like they go golfing with the CIO anymore. If you think about the big breakout companies of the last few years, Slack or Zoom, they all start with individual teams embracing a product like Slack, then other teams embrace it. They love the integrations, they love that they can be power users, and then eventually, once there's evangelists inside the company, the CIO says, okay, great, now we're gonna go wall to wall inside the company. That's never been possible before. So you have these digital natives who speak in emojis, these are the people that text instead of ringing the doorbell when they show up at your house, and they've been given budget authority. And that's a big fundamental change in the way that we build software, who we're building it for, and how we sell it. And so this is ultimately what gets me really excited. We're heading towards a future in the enterprise where everybody gets to be a power user, not just developers, and not, it's not by just learning how to code. I'm excited for the future of software. Thanks for being here today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the summit.